Halo, selamat siang. Nama saya Bo. Saya seorang uh, CTO dan co-founder co dari Dari Sendit. Um, I want to address the graduates today. Uh, first, I want to offer them a round of applause for all of their hard work uh, in the last months. Um, and I also want to give them some of the lessons that I wish that I had received when I was first becoming a software engineer. So it's important to know, it's important to know the kind of world that you're about to enter. In this world, software is truly eating the world. These days, we are very comfortable in living our lives on the internet. And soon, in a few years, we will trust AI to drive our cars and beat our best champions in chess and go. These days, it's never been easier to make an impact. With services like AWS, a small team of engineers can make a large impact. When WhatsApp was acquired by Facebook, they had 13 people. When Instagram was acquired by Facebook, they had about 35 people. This is an incredibly small amount of people building the services that we all use today. That being said, it's never been easier to make a negative impact. We all know recently Facebook leaked 87 million user records. And in the US, Equifax leaked 148 million. That's one in every two Americans. So what is our role as software engineers today? I'm going to give you a pretty short list. We build products that people want. We build products quickly. We update products in response to feedback and market data. We build products that are bug free. We build products that are high throughput, low latency, and are easily horizontally and vertically scaled. We build products that are secure, and we build products in teams with other engineers. And we build tools to assist in building products. We coach and we mentor other engineers, and we write clean code. And of course, we play ping pong. So actually, I lied. It's a very long list. Um, and so living in this world today, with the responsibilities that we have, it's very easy to develop some fears. And these are the fears that I've seen working in this industry. The first one is to compare yourself to others and feel like you're not talented. How many people in this room have written an open source um, operating system? Raise your hands if you have. Nobody, okay. But Linus Torvalds has, it's called Linux, right? Somebody has done it. Who in this room has written an open source version control system? Nobody, it's called Git. You guys use it every day. Linus Torvalds also came up with it. Um, so it's easy, my point is that it's easy when you compare yourself to others to feel like you're not talented. The second thing is to be afraid of not being able to keep up with the pace of innovation. These days, there are too many things to keep up with. Every day there's a new cryptocurrency, there's a new programming language, there's a new thing that we can connect to our Wi-Fi uh, and our, uh, and our uh, homes. Um, so it's easy to feel like you're being left behind by the pace of innovation. The last thing I think uh, is a pretty common one for new engineers, which is to be afraid of causing a catastro catastrophic disaster. This is like you're dropping a database in production. Uh, this is, you know, releasing uh, some, some feature that wasn't ready. Um, and I think the point is that the scale of the services that we build today is much larger than the scale it was before. So any mistake that we make is amplified by that scale. If Facebook goes down for an hour, that's massive. So I want to share with you my personal story. Um, I want to tell you um, how I've developed these fears uh, and how over time 
I've learned to manage some of them. Uh, so I'll start with where I'm from. I uh, was born in Beijing. I grew up in northeast China. Uh, I lived with my grandparents for about five years while my parents were studying in the US. Um, and it gets very cold. So I don't know if you guys have ever experienced something that cold. Um, I have a few pictures. So these are cute pictures of me. Uh, I'm the cute one here. And I'm the cute, cute one there as well. Um, it's not relevant to this talk. Um, so my first programming experience um, was in high school. I was 14. Uh, the first language was C++. You're actually very lucky that you don't have to learn C++. It's a very bad language. Um, I think some people in this room know what I'm talking about. Um, and I spent a lot of time not doing classwork, so I don't recommend this either. Um, but I created a text-based adventure game with some of my friends. Um, and I got in trouble with the teacher because uh, the teacher was one of the characters in that game. Um, and he wasn't a hero. I'll just say that. Um, so after, after high school, I went to university. I was uh, UC Berkeley EECS, class of 2014. Um, and actually, this is when I realized that I'm not smart. Um, so I think when you go to a university like Berkeley, you end up competing with um, these kids who have spent their entire lives learning about math, learning about CS. Um, it's, it's really, really hard to keep up with that. Um, additionally, the course, the pace of the coursework and the depth were much, uh, were much more difficult than anything that I had experienced before. Um, and also, I, I started doing hackathons in university, and I also didn't win any hackathons. So um, university was a pretty low point for me, I think. Um, so the first internship that I got, I was very desperate because I didn't do that well in school. Um, so I was very desperate to find an internship. I took an unpaid job building a, call, a payments app with only college interns. So you probably can imagine how that goes. It failed in five months. Um, and for one release, I slept on the ground for three nights in the office. Um, and I covered myself. We had some free t-shirts back then. So I covered myself with those free t-shirts as a blanket. And I used the, I used the t-shirts as a pillow, pillow as well. So I hope, I hope none of you have to do that in your next job. Um, my first full-time job was at a startup named Brandcast. They were building a uh, WYSIWYG website editor. So what you see is what you get. Uh, sort of like Wix or um, something like that. Um, the CTO, he finished his degree at UC Berkeley, the same, the same program as mine, in two years. He was a, C a CTO at a previous startup as well. Um, and one of my coworkers didn't go to college, but he was 19 years old at the time. And he taught himself everything that he knew about uh, front-end engineering. And he knew uh, very deeply about the way that the browser renders, um, understands very deeply in how to optimize uh, these things. Um, the next company I worked at was called Ripple Labs. Um, so Ripple, Ripple is the company that has developed the third largest cryptocurrency in the world by market cap, uh, second to, uh, sorry, behind Ethereum and, and Bitcoin. Uh, they have the top cryptographic experts in the world. They put out white papers on consensus um, each year. And the CTO was an early Bitcoin adopter. Um, he had already become rich. So that was good for him. Um, so then after, after Ripple, I uh, founded Sendit. And um, Sendit, we went through YC. So we were batch uh, summer 2015. Um, for those of you who don't know, YC is a startup accelerator. Um, they had companies like Dropbox and Airbnb. Um, some of the companies in my batch were working on AR, VR, uh, you know, drone delivery, some really, really uh, cool stuff. And one of my roles here is to ensure that the engineering team can rapidly deliver on scalability and new products. Uh, and currently, we process millions of payments per month and, in total, uh, billions of US dollars per year. So in summary, um, I've had to compare myself against some of the smartest people in the world. Um, at Sendit, I compare myself to other CTOs, other very successful entrepreneurs um, in Silicon Valley and also here in Indonesia. Um, I worked in places with rapidly evolving technology. At Sendit, we need to rethink our technology in order to maintain the scale that we continue to see. Um, at Ripple, 
um, I was forced to learn quickly about uh, cryptocurrencies, the market, consensus, all of these, all of these sort of new concepts. Um, and the potential impact of mistakes are getting higher. As I mentioned, we're processing millions of payments a month, billions a year. So any sort of mistake that we create at Sendit will end up becoming a massive impact. And at Ripple, the current market cap of, of Ripple is 25 trillion US dollars. Kind of, hard to, kind of hard to understand that big of a number. So I want to, I want to give the graduates some tools for managing some of these fears. Um, because I think that it's important to have the fear, um, but it's also important to learn how to manage it. So if you're worried about comparing yourself to others, I think there will always be somebody better than you. The world has 7 billion people, so probabilistically speaking, you're not the best one. Um, what I really believe in is to focus on growth. Right? Don't compare yourself to from where you are with somebody else. Compare the rate at which you're growing. As long as you're growing faster than somebody, I think it's fine. And I think a lot of people forget that software engineering is supposed to be fun. Like, it really is supposed to be fun, and there are parts of it which you can love. For me personally, I really love distributed applications, building distributed applications. And for me, it's enough just to build something like that. I can be happy. If you're worried about keeping up with innovation, uh, it's also not possible to keep up with everything. Just from a mathematical point of view, again, the number of things that people are producing is just more than you can consume. I think the advice I can give you here is to pick tools and techniques to master before moving on. Because the hard and interesting problems that you will face can only be solved through mastery. And something that people also forget is that new is not always better. And old is not always worse. But pick tools and frameworks that are simple. Because the problems that you face are already going to be complicated enough without you having to fight your own tools and frameworks. Um, regarding causing catastrophic damage, um, I think a lot of the companies that you join will have a safe place for you to work. There will be a development environment where you can make all the mistakes that you want drop all the databases that you want, and everything's going to be OK. I highly urge you to follow standard development practice. We have developed these practices so that we can uh, release features to production safely together. And don't be afraid of causing damage. Be afraid of not being able to fix it. It's, it's impossible that nothing will go wrong. But if you don't anticipate things going wrong, then that's the problem. So in closing, um, I want to welcome again these graduates to our world of software engineering. I think there are many things to be excited and afraid about. And I think that you sort of need both in order to be successful. If you're excited but not afraid, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. If you're not excited uh, and it, sorry, sorry. If you're excited but not afraid, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. If you're not excited and afraid, you shouldn't be a software engineer. So I urge our graduates today to learn to manage both your excitement and your fear to become a great engineer. Thank you.